I find it depressing how one of our most fascinating birds, crows and ravens, are still viewed by many so harshly, despite all the research over the years. They are native birds, this land is theirs, and we should be embracing them. They deserve our love and appreciation because under that mysterious black attire lies a misunderstood, beautiful bird full of interesting behaviors, some that are even similar to our own. In this video, I want to help people to see these birds in a new light and understand them a little better. Enjoy! Just as humans are monogamous for the most part, crows too tend to stick with one partner, but they may take it more seriously than we do because pairs often remain together for life. They do break up sometimes though. Interestingly, they don't always run off to find a mate as soon as they are sexually mature, which is around two years of age. Often, it can be as many as several years before a crow will look for a mate. Maybe that's why their relationship success is better than ours. Until then, they remain with their parents and other siblings from previous years. Once a pair is together, though, it's a fairly close union. During the mating period, the male guards his female, and once egg laying begins, the male stays close by, keeping watch of the nest area for extended periods of time. Like humans, crows too are really family oriented. Young typically remain with their parents for several years before going out on their own. A family of crows can have as many as 15 individuals, including the parents and siblings from previous years. It's thought that they keep lifelong relationships with siblings, aunts, uncles, and maybe grandparents. After all, they do join communal roosts every night during winter. Surely there must be a familiar family member in the crowd. The young that stay take part in raising their parents' newest brood, something that is called cooperative breeding. They will help out by bringing food to their mother while she incubates, as well as to the babies. They also help guard the nest area by keeping a lookout for any potential threats. Being so close to one another, crows are also pretty affectionate, often preening one another, something that is known as aloe preening. Rarely fights break out between family members, usually it's just a light scolding, kind of like us, you know? Interestingly, like people, crows hold funerals. Okay, maybe not the kind of funerals we hold, but a funeral nonetheless. If one crow dies, a flock of crows will surround the deceased, however, not only to mourn the dead, but also to figure out what killed their member. If they figure out it was a bird of prey or something of that nature, they will band together and chase the predator away. Crows and ravens are prominent figures in folklore and mythology around the world, often portrayed as evil portents of misfortune. And why is that? Because of how they look. They're large and black with a seemingly eerie mystery about them. Often even thought of as ugly. To make matters worse, they don't make particularly beautiful songs, instead it's that coarse ca. <coughs> Surprising to many though, crows are songbirds, as are all corvids. People often think that what makes a songbird is their ability to sing beautiful songs, and while many songbirds actually do sing lovely songs, there are plenty who don't, and some songbirds rarely even sing at all. To be honest, over the past seven years of birding and getting familiar with the crows in my area, I've come to actually love their sounds. I'm not bothered in the slightest by them. Don't be fooled by their mysterious black color either. In the right lighting, crows are actually very beautiful birds, and they are even colorful. Certain angles and lighting situations reveal shimmering colors of green, blue, and purples. This is the same for ravens, too. It is known as iridescent black. Up close, their plumage has a pretty pattern, too. And just look at that face. Such a cutie. Because crows live in cities and are used to humans, they can provide a wonderful opportunity for casual birders to witness some interesting and fun bird behavior up close. Since crows are highly intelligent, this makes the experience even better because you truly don't know what you will witness them do. For example, crows hold territories and don't take kindly to intruders such as ravens or birds of prey flying through. They also don't like other predators like foxes, coyotes, and cats. You can bet that if any one of them are near, crows will make a dramatic scene out of it, cawing and dive bombing the predator. They will even go so far as to hitch a ride on a bird of prey they are chasing off. I have seen lone crows chase off a huge eagle which was just comical because the eagle is so much larger than the crow. Those birds are fearless and full of antics. 
And I swear that ravens, the much larger cousin to crows, will deliberately pass through a crow territory just to razz them up. And being as smart as ravens are, known for seemingly having a playful nature, I wouldn't be surprised if that's what they do sometimes. For centuries, crows have been considered pests and shot because of it. It's thought that they destroy the nests and young of game birds and destroy sprouting corn. No doubt that crows can have a significant effect on the nest success of waterfowl. However, the reputation for eating eggs and young of waterfowl, as well as songbirds, is likely exaggerated because during spring, the primary food source of crows seems to be earthworms. I can vouch for that. A family of crows I've known for years frequent my garden in search of worms and other insects. It is also thought that crows can cause a lot of damage to farms, but in fact they may do more good than harm. A study in southern Ontario, Canada found that cornfields frequented by crows in winter have fewer problems with European corn borers in the next growing season than those not. The crows eat up significant numbers of the larvae overwintering in old corn stalks. They also help with cleaning up dead animals. Dead animals laying around decomposing can spread disease. But with opportunistic eaters like crows around, that's not a problem because they are more than happy to eat a dead rodent or anything else. Contrary to popular belief, crows are not thought to be the direct cause of West Nile virus either. Instead, they are just unlucky victims to the disease. A carrier of the disease is the threat. And since crows are dying at alarming numbers from the disease, they therefore can't be the culprits. I might do an entire video on this soon. Birds of Cornell had this to say. Just like the canary in the mineshaft, crows may be the first to go and can alert us to the presence of the virus. They also had this to say. There is no evidence of bird-to-human transmission of the virus. Rather, the virus is spread by infected mosquitoes, which only bite live birds. Dead birds should be reported to your county health department. If you want to read more about that, I will provide a link to this page in the description box. Crows have relatively large brains for their size, which is the case for all members of the corvid family, like jays and magpies, to name a couple. However, crows and ravens have exceptionally large forebrains, the domain of analytical thought, higher level sensory processing, and flexible behavior. They can fashion tools to obtain food and even memorize the roots of the garbage man so that they get an easy snack. They also remember which truck drivers are nice enough to open cans for them. And an example of tool use, one crow broke off pieces of pine cone to drop on tree climbers near its nest. They remember people very well, the mean and good ones, and don't forget easily either, as a study from the University of Washington, Seattle discovered. As they trapped in bandit crows around the university, the team wore a latex caveman mask. When they later returned to those locations, either maskless or wearing a different mask the crows had never seen before, the birds ignored them. But anybody showing up in a caveman mask would cause the crows to freak out and start mobbing. It wasn't just the trapped birds that responded. Apparently, others who had witnessed the abduction and remembered it did too. Whole gangs of crows followed the masked people, scolding and dive-bombing them. The research group retested the birds, and after 10 years, not only did the crows not forget, but the knowledge keeps spreading. This is because when a crow sees other birds mobbing, it joins in, learning and remembering the identity of the villain. Each time, more birds mob and scold. Nearly all of the birds originally trapped by the caveman are likely dead by now, yet knowledge of the caveman mass still grows. They also remember the good people, and even their cars. It's true, a family of crows I've been visiting for years know my car very well. All other cars can stop on the road in the very spot I do when I visit them, and the crows won't bother. But as soon as I stop there, they come over. In a few cases, crows will even leave trinkets in return for people who give them food. I can say that I have not been lucky enough to have that happen though, but it's cool that it do. So I'm curious, what are your thoughts on crows? Have you always liked them? Did you used to hate them but now see them differently? Please let me know below, I enjoy reading all of your comments. I can say that I've never hated them, but I never thought much about them either. But since getting to know many of them over the last seven years of birding, I can say that I absolutely love them. Wonderful birds. I hope you enjoyed the video. Also, before you go, I wanted to let you know that I have created a new shirt design for all of you crow lovers out there like myself. If you are interested and would like to help support me in what I do as a content creator, I will leave a link below in the description. The shirts are only available for a limited time, so don't miss out. Happy birding!